I'm just going to give a big warning up front first that I don't like idle games. But I'll be doing a quick first impressions review anyway because I think it's worth giving things a chance, even if I don't like them. And since this is a first impressions video, my opinions aren't exactly the most concrete because I've only spent a total of 3-5 to five hours playing this game and getting a rough feel around it. A video on this would be completely different and packed with more like a massive tutorial and a love letter if I got deep enough into it to start shitting it like Arkea. Alright, so on to the main point. Today, we'll be looking specifically at Project Sekai Kalfu Stage. It is a free mobile rhythm game on both iOS and Android developed by Craft Egg and published by Sega. If you didn't know, Craft Egg is the same company behind Bang Dream, aka Bandori. So it looks like we're in good hands for all the idle bits that makes an idle game an idle game. If it's not obvious enough, the main selling point of Project Sekai is vocal or Hatsune Miku. Yeah, Hatsune Miku. Nobody else matters enough except for Miku obviously, according to the English localization team. Project Sekai is apparently a spin-off of Project Diva but has a cast of 20 new original characters split into 5 idle band units. If 20 characters and 5 idol groups sound like a lot to you, yeah, they are. But don't worry, I'll be talking about this more later. There are actually two versions of Project Sekai. The Project Sekai that's available in Japan, and the Project Sekai, I mean, Hatsumiku Kalfu Stage that's for the US. Also known as a global version. But is it really global when I can't download it in my region? This sort of thing is pretty normal in Japanese games with gacha elements. I'm not 100% on this, but the last I remembered, it's because this is to help time the events in the game properly. Japanese versions are released first, of course, and are actually running for a few months already when the English versions are finally released. If you're not into getting the latest things immediately, the US version should be just fine for you. And because, well, it's also in English. Don't note that the US Project Sekai is a year behind the Japanese version. The gameplay is extremely simple. You have your tap notes, your hold notes, there are also slides, and uh, flick notes. Also, there's hold release timing. Yay! Flicks normally point upwards. For those, you can flick in any direction and they'll count as a perfect. Though, there are also other directional flicks in the game as well. Note for those that you have to make sure that you flick in the correct direction or you will only score great. Normally, I really hate flicks, but in this game, they're actually pretty good. Most of the time, they're charter in a really fun way. But note that by the time you reach master charts, they become a game of trying to be able to flick and tap fast at the same time. Though another interesting thing I noticed about the flicks in this game is that the flicks operate differently from other ring games. Ring games like Lanota and Free Girls count the flick when you do the flick movement. But for Project Sekai, it counts when your fingers do the tap and then the flick. This way of flicks is more difficult than the Lanota Free Girls way of flicks because you can't cheese flicks as much anymore. It's possible that this way of implementing flicks could be why the game doesn't feel like there's much audio delay between the hit sounds and the music compared to other in games. But it also could be very well because the audio engine is implemented very well in this game. Don't get me wrong, there still is audio delay but it's mainly coming from my device side. I still had to set an offset even playing to my tapping sounds instead of hit sounds, but the delay is quite small and the game feels fluid. Side note if you're interested, this game is a part of the on the line group if it's not obvious enough and well, it uses an audio offset. In Project Sekai, the size of the notes can vary which makes for some interesting looking charts. Combined with the flicks all over the place, the game has a layer of reading difficulty on top of it. Whole release timing is, well, not fun in this game. Because I noticed in some charts, the whole notes are charted like slider notes in Osu Standard. An example is that they sometimes have the whole note and on a new beat like some Osu Standard songs do, which makes the game feel off when you play without hit songs. <laughs> This kind of note charting style combined with the flicks makes it so that the most optimal way to play the game is with hit sounds. Don't get me wrong though, you can play the game without hit sounds and get used to it. In fact, you might even be better in the game without hit sounds. But for me personally, I had to play with hit sounds because of the whole hold note charting thing. And since for me, I mainly play the game listening to the hit sounds instead of my taps, I recommend using an earpiece or headphones while playing this game. And that's why this video is sponsored by Rhythm. Just kidding, these sound so bad I wouldn't torture you guys like that. But since we rhythm gamers basically listen to music all the time because of what we're playing, it's a treat to have something that actually sounds good in your ears, and also doesn't have latency because it uses Bluetooth or something. So this video is actually brought to you by Critical. He's an audio guy who has reviewed over 1000 IEMs. I met him at an event a couple weeks ago and he sent me one of his newest collab IEMs, the Truth Ear X Critical Zero IEM. I'm not being paid for this, but he did send me one for free. It's an in-ear monitor developed by Truthier with the help of Critical for the tuning. The way it's built is by using two dynamic drivers, one for the majority of the frequencies as well as another driver for the bass frequencies, both being connected to a crossover, making this IEM one of the very few IEMs with a technical subwoofer more or less. And okay, for those who are lost on me, this IEM is tuned to the Harman in-ear target. The Harman target is a target created by Harman International's own research on what's most pleasing to people. So this 
this IEM is based on that. And because of the tuning with the crossover design and drivers, the Truth Ear X Critical Zero IEM is not especially fatiguing in the high frequencies while keeping details and a rather pleasant bass slam. It makes music feel more alive. And by the way, it's also only $50. It's still within the budget market and definitely cheaper than a certain. So if you're looking to up your listening experience, go give them a try. Or at the very least, go check out Critical's videos. Because if you like my review style, chances are you'll enjoy his videos as well. Thanks to Critical for sending me these and back to the video. The game is also thumb friendly. It's not like Arcade or Scythus where you have to do a lot of moving your fingers across each other and all over the screen. So it's actually more friendly to players with bigger sized phone screens. Since you don't need your thumb to be able to reach the other side of the screen, comfortably. However, just note that when you reach the hardest shots like 33 and 34, it's probably not so doable on thumbs. All in all, the gameplay reminds me of Trinitum, but without the air notes and the $400 controller. The charting style is a little similar for the higher difficulties as well. I actually find the game really fun, and it's really no surprise that the game is such a hit in gameplay. As much as I hate flicks, I really don't dislike them in this game at all. They work as a perfectly logical substitute to raising your hands in Trinitum. Just to note, I just realized that there isn't an early late indicator in the score screen or the game itself. Though apparently this is a feature missing in the global version only, and it is in the Japanese version for now, but that's still pretty bad actually. Like any perfectly sane normal person, the first thing I did when I downloaded the Project Sekai, I bought the hardest song I could find in a song shop and played it. And I was pleasantly surprised. It was a good chart. This was completely unlike my first experience when I tried Bandori. What the fuck is that? To be fair, in Pandora and a lot of other rhythm games defense, the first few charts they give you on default are usually their oldest charts. Old charts tend to be quite bad because the charters are still trying to get a hang of charting in their respective games, which makes the Project Sekai first experience even better. Chances are, either Sega had a lot of control over the game, which makes sense to why the charts are higher quality and feels like a mobile trinitum, or the people assigned to charting from Craft Egg are already experienced charters themselves. The other impressive thing about the game was the fact that I got one of the most difficult songs within the first 5 minutes. Project Sekai doesn't restrict you in what order of the songs to get, so you could start the game and just get anything that's difficult or what you like without paying a single cent. This is something that's pretty rare in other non-community run rhythm games and I really like that. The three most difficult charts right now on Global are rated difficulty 33, and they're Intense Voice, Disappearance, and Six Trillion Nights. I wouldn't say they're overcharted because for the songs that they are, it's to be expected to be very difficult. Though on the Japan version right now, they have more difficult songs than that, with a master rating of 34 to them. They're mostly collab songs with other Sega rhythm games like Trinita, Mongeki, and Mai Mai. The other thing that Project Sekai doesn't restrict you is on retrying songs, and that's because the energy system in this game isn't tied to how much you can play. Yep, you can have zero energy and still play songs. Energy is just used to boost the amount of rewards you get when you finish alive, which is a blessing. Thank God! And the song unlock methods are okay, I guess. They are nowhere as terrible as Arkea's world map song unlock methods, but then again, Arkea's song unlock method is actually one of the absolute worst of any mobile running game I've seen, so that's not a very high bar to cross. You unlock songs by buying them in the music shop with music tickets. You get music tickets as you read stories or complete missions. Basically, play X number of times to unlock more stuff. But like other idle rhythm games, without good characters for score, expect to see even if you all perfect a song. Which is really dumb, I'm not gonna lie. But there are rewards for getting a certain combo amount, which is good because at least there's an incentive for the average gacha player to get better at playing the game and mobile charts. The 3D MVs in the background are pretty cool too. They look good for a mobile game, and you can turn it off in the settings if you find it distracting or if your device just can't keep up the 3D. There are actually a few other alternative options for the background. Other than a 3D MV, there's a 2D MV, and then the original song MV, and a light mode. It's nice that the devs gave a ton of options in the settings to declutter the gameplay, like the character cut in effects, the skill display, and whatnot, but this is pretty standard in idle games to be honest. Project Sekai's gameplay settings are nowhere as customizable as Bandori or other run games like Oroteno, but honestly it's not a deal breaker. I really can't see why you should be allowed to change note size or note theme in a game like this. This game is about Vocaloids, so of course the main song list consists of a lot of already licensed Vocaloid songs from SEGA. In Project Sekai, you can choose between listening to the cover of the song by the Idol Goals or a Vocaloid. There are also other popular Japanese songs in the game, like songs by EVE, and by the way, there's songs from Ado in the Japan version right now, oh my god. The song list is generally very appealing to the average weeb on the internet. 
I'm not the slightest bit surprised about this though. This is Sega, and this is also an idol game that we're talking about. They have to be able to appeal to the biggest audience, and this is the best way to do it. It's nice having songs that I normally listen to outside of games inside of one. I mean, the whole popular J-pop songs thing is a big reason why Sega is slowly beating Konami in popularity in the rhythm game scene in the arcade nowadays. Overall, I like the song list and the option to just listen to vocal covers. When you first start up the game, you're greeted by Miku basically giving you a personality test. She'll ask you stuff to basically sort you into choosing one of the five bands and starting their story. The basic plotline is that all these characters end up in their own worlds separate from reality called Sekai. They enter Sekai by playing this song called Untitled on their phones. Apparently, it's a place formed from the feelings of people who have issues, I think. I guess it's like white space in Amori, except instead of a lonely depressing room, you get vocaloid therapists in there. The point of Sekai is to help people find their true feelings, or something like that. The five band groups are Leonid, More More Jump, Vivid Bad Squad, Wonderland's X Showtime, and Night Court at 25. There are men in some of the groups, which was a surprise to me. I thought they would go with a full all-girls cast to maximize the idol appeal of the game, but they didn't. So that's cool. So the story. Leo Need is about a bunch of friends drifting apart, so they decide to form a band group to spend more time together. Momo Jump has Minori, who has terrible luck but wants to become an idol like her idol, Haruka. Though during the opening, she ends up meeting Haruka, who decided to quit being an idol and joined her school. But somehow, they end up forming a group together. Vivid Bad Squad has An, and who looks up to her idol dad and wants to surpass him and his idol group one day. But the issue is that she doesn't have a band group. She ends up with Sekai with another girl called Kohane after solo performing on the street. And I haven't read further than that. Wonderland's ex Showtime starts with a dude called Tsukasa who wants to become a star, but but can't remember why he wants to become one. There's probably more to his story, but I'm sorry, I really don't like clowns or this guy. <laughs> Night Court at 25 has K, who wants to become a composer like her dad who died or something tragic happened to him. Her goal is to become a composer who writes songs that will make people happy, and she is totally hardcore driven to write a song to save someone? And that's pretty much so far about all the stories that I read. Speaking of which, each Seka has their own version of Miku, which is cool I guess. But honestly, I don't really care about any of the characters or the story at all or all the nice Miku outfits, because this is a gacha game. It's gacha first game second. Obviously, there's going to be 20 different original characters. They need to find a way to pad out the pool of characters you can pull from the gacha on top of different clothing styles they'll wear during different events. It's really hard to care about the characters or the story with this exact thought at the back of my mind the entire time. And in general, it's just terrible story writing to dump different characters and five different stories on you at once. But don't get me wrong, I do find the stories interesting enough to read when I am reading them. But since my focus is kind of everywhere and all at once, I get out of that interest really quickly. Though admittedly, I haven't read that far in yet and I know the story actually gets really good. But for a first impression, this is not very great. So will I continue reading the story instead of hitting quit to quickly farm music tickets? Yes, actually. I do like stories, and I can see how people get really invested in the lore of this game. It's a slow descent if you slowly read along leisurely and eventually get invested in it. I know I sound extremely negative here, but it's really not that bad. The UI of this game is a little confusing. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is not a cluttered screen at all. It's just that the game has a lot of things going on. <sighs> Wait, but maybe the UI isn't confusing. The game is just confusing. So let's see. The Steam composition when you play different songs with different characters, all the different benefits, you can get any points. It's also a little bit about how you can get by leveling up specific items and blocking cards, stories, leveling up the cards, master rank. Oh, I've mentioned that the ghost has been members of the cards which you pull from the gacha. Like all gacha games, you can't get a card one depending on the season. All you have going on is a roll of dice to what you're getting, and there's also a typical gacha star rating system of one for an and as we expect, the gacha percentages are low for the cards, and you have your own currency, which is crystals that you buy from the cash shop to pull characters, or use the gacha tickets to pull characters, and each card is a different skill, and the better than rare cards can have more than one skill. The faster you are, 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 the faster you
in the end, is to be expected of a gacha game. They usually have all kind of extra fluff on top of it, where it basically amounts to a card building stat game that is also dependent on season time-based events. But if you're familiar with games like these, none of this should be that confusing to you and quite standard to be honest. I'm not someone who plays gacha games myself, so I genuinely found it extremely confusing, especially since the game lacks tutorials and explanations outside of the actual rhythm gameplay. Don't get me wrong, they do have these banners when you click around on a new screen, but it's extremely simplified and it just leaves me more confused than I was before. Another example of bad UI choice for beginners and familiarity is when you want to do something and it shows you that you can't do that because you don't have an item. Naturally, you would tap the item icon to find out what it is and where to get it, but nothing happens. In the most technical sense, this is a rhythm game, but it's also a rhythm game that doesn't really care about the typical player improvement curve. Like gacha games, the actual gameplay is just there to pad the gacha. I mean, there's the typical everyday login bonus, everyday mission bonus, there's even an autoplay function here like Raid Shadow Legends. And alright, they also have a battle pass system. But of course, just like how someone else can focus on the gacha and ignore a lot of the runa game parts, you can do the inverse and ignore the gacha parts of the game and just play the runa game. You can perfectly play and enjoy this game as a free-to-play player. I just really don't like gacha and the stat and card building in any rhythm game. It doesn't work with team card building that messes with your final score. These two genres just don't mix. I didn't like it either in Noise Starlight. This is why there's a lot of people like myself who consider idol games to be in a whole genre of their own because this really isn't the usual rhythm game experience. You know something is up when only a minute or so of this 24 minute video on Project Sekai actually talked about other gameplay. I'm not saying Saying everything in this game has to be extremely hardcore, and every single person playing this has to be a competitive all perfect on the hardest difficulties with difficulty mods gamer. Rhythm games are fun, and they can be fun even if they are easy. But anyways, I've strayed a bit far from the video topic. Let's go back to talking about Project Sekai. Project Sekai is quite the interesting gacha idol game, where the gameplay part is actually really, really nice. As much as I made Project Sekai sound like other gacha idol games where they put the gameplay on the back burner, Project Sekai excelled at its rhythm game parts. It's like to the devs, the game mattered a lot as well. The charting is nice, the engine is really good, and the experience, ignoring everything else, is extremely enjoyable. Project Sekai is in this really weird spot for me where half of the game works out so well, and I would daily drive the game if I had the time, but the other half is just really not for me. <laughs> but over Overall, the game is extremely casual friendly with how it's beginner and dumb friendly, it has very popular Japanese songs in it, it has waifus, and it's free to play. I'd say my overall experience with the game was still a positive one. Maybe in the future, when I'm bored, I might properly start looking into the cards, characters and items and all that, but that's not something I can see myself doing anytime soon. Tia the game's alright, and that's it for the video. Let me know in the comments what you think about the game and whatnot. Hope you guys enjoyed, see you guys next time.